and thank you for joining us for the final design meeting and construction kickoff for site 90 K8 N7, which is a kindergarten through eighth grade school opening in 2022 in the Wolf Lake area. A few housekeeping notes about how this meeting will work. Attendees are automatically muted with cameras off. Please use the Q&A tool to enter your questions. You can ask questions at any time during the meeting, but we will get to those questions during the Q&A portion at the end if we're not able to answer earlier after the presentation. The chat is available as a backup, but please do uh, direct any questions into the Q&A panel. Um, if you could advance the slide, Ed, please. The video icons that you see are panelists who are available to answer questions today. I will be introducing them shortly. If you face any technical issues, you can reach WebEx support at 1-866-229-3239, extension 2, extension 1. Now, I've also put that into the chat. Uh, hopefully, no one will need that. Okay, one more, Ed. Thank you. This meeting is being recorded and will be posted on the OCPS Facilities Communications YouTube page as well as sent out at, as a link. The presentation slides will also be posted on the facilities website, which is facilities.ocps.net, and they'll be posted on board member Bird's page at www.ocps.net. And then you click on school board and you choose member Bird, and this will be there as well. Um, today, we're going to cover the final design and the construction plans for site 90 K8 N7 which is the K-8 school opening in 2022 in the Wolf Lake area. But before we get started, let's turn to board member Melissa Bird for welcome remarks. Thank you, Lauren. I appreciate that. Thank you everyone for joining us um, tonight. I appreciate you giving up some of your time. This is uh, exciting. This is an exciting meeting. Um, it, it is my first meeting actually. Um, this is my first time going through this process of building a new school as a school board member. So I'm kind of going through this with you guys, um, just like you are, I'm learning along the way. So um, I'm really excited for tonight. I'm excited to see where we're at with the plans. Um, and I'm excited to see what um, what's coming up. We are ready to get started building this beautiful school, um, which is going to be such an asset to our community. And this was such a um, such a, a needed project. I'm so excited that we got it moved up and that we are going to have this wonderful school to um, to uh, share with our community. Um, I'm excited that we're going to finally have a K-8. Uh, it's going to be fantastic. So I'm excited for tonight. I'm excited to see what's in store. I want to thank our facilities department for um, putting all of this together. I want to thank um, Ziskovich Architects for their hard work on this plan. We worked out some um, key and um, I'm excited that we were able to do that. And I'm also ex um, very thankful for Wharton Smith, who I believe is um, with us tonight. They're the um, contractors. So it's going to be a great, um, a great presentation. I'm excited to see it happen. So thank you all for joining us. Okay, thank you, Board Member Bird. So I'd like to introduce the panelists who are here to possibly answer questions tonight as we go. Um, in addition to Board Member Bird, we have Area Superintendent Raheem Jones. Um, we do have uh, some of the principals on from the schools that will be feeders into this school. I saw that Carol Gramando and uh, Cynthia Hopp did make it on, and uh, I think we might see Frank Matucci from Zellwood also. Um, as Melissa mentioned, Ziskovich is the architect, and from Ziskovich we have Ed Napier, and we have George, um, George Del Castillo. Okay, um, there is a traffic engineer on this project, um, that's CPH, and Sandra Gorman is here representing CPH. The C civil engineer is Klima Weeks, and Jay Klima is here. Um, so the group that's going to be building this project is Wharton Smith. They're the construction manager for the project, and we have David Romero and Brad Newton here. Uh, and then we have a number of members of the OCPS facilities team as well. Uh, we have Mo Arthur, who's our design manager. Um, I'm expecting to see uh, Jessma Lambert, director of construction planning. Christopher Mills from facilities planning is here. Um, we have two project managers for this project, uh, Cody Smith 
and Tamara Cox. Uh, they've both been work working on this project and their liaison between um, the the project itself and the school district and kind of making sure that everything comes together. Um, we might see senior facilities executive director Rory Salambeen, um from OCPS police. We have commander George Olemski. We have Adam Zubritsky from transportation and Devania Burns from fire health and safety. Um, we also did uh, invite Apopka's traffic division to, to join the call. Um, not seeing that they are on yet. Um, and I think we had gotten an RSVP that Commissioner Moore might be coming on as well. So I didn't want to go without mentioning um, that she might might be here to listen as well. Um, on, on that note, if you could just go to the next slide, Ed. So we always put this in here because this is such a common question that we always get at these meetings. Um, so this project will be rezoned. Um, Mark up, I'm in the middle of a meeting, sorry. Uh, so basically what happens is that this uh, this project will go through the rezoning project process um, for, oh, I'm sorry. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna start that over. So this project will be zoned um, through a process that'll involve notifying all the families that might be affected. It will begin in the spring. This is a process that all parents will be able to weigh in on. You'll be able to give comments and give feedback. There will be community meetings. And uh, that first meeting is expected to be in spring of 2021. So we don't have anything to report for you on zoning yet. Um, but the reason we go ahead and do these meetings is because the school needs to be designed before we can build it. And we don't want to rezone uh, too far in advance of the school because then we miss people who move in the uh, immediate run up to a school opening. So on that note, I'm going to hand things over to Ed. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Lauren. As Lauren said, my name is Ed Napier. I'm with Discovich Architects. We are the design architect on this project. We are super excited, like uh, just like uh, board member Bird mentioned uh, about this job. And I'm going to take you through the site and the amenities of the building and what you guys can expect uh, on this future uh, school site. So as you can see, uh, the, the site location here with my pointer in the yellow is uh, east of the uh, 429, north of the existing Wolf Lake uh, Elementary and Middle School in the uh, Wolf Lake area just off of Jason Dwelly. This is just another zoomed in version showing the site location uh, in correspondence to the adjacent neighborhoods. So let's talk a little bit about the site. The site is uh, 14, just under 15 acres, it's 14.2 acres, it's existing parcel uh, just west of Jason Dwelly and the Spin, Finish, Spin Fisher Drive intersection. It's currently a um, slightly wooded site, so we're going to come through and we're going to make some changes to that, and we're going to talk a little bit about that on the next slide. So this is the uh, final design site layout as uh, Lauren had mentioned that we have come through it to this point, and this is what, what the uh, project will look like. I'm going to take you through some of the site data first, uh, just so you guys can get an idea of the overall site, and I'll talk. I'll point out some of the major major points, and then access to the site that you can expect, whether you're bringing your child, or the child is riding the bus, or the child might be walking or riding a bicycle. So, again, uh, the site is uh, located off Jason Dwelly. There is a separate bus and parent drop-off entry for this site, so those traffic patterns do not mix. We have queuing on site, which queues along this looping area here, back and forth as you wind your way through the parking lot for 243 vehicles, which is uh, equivalent of uh, 4,860 feet, so almost a mile of queuing on site, so we don't anticipate any traffic backing up onto Jason Dwelly causing any traffic problems. We're providing parking for 148 vehicles and queuing for 13 buses. So now I'm gonna talk, take you guys through uh, entering and exiting the site. So again, whether you're coming from the south or the north, you're gonna be entering at this intersection to drop your child off. You'll pull in and you'll make your way through the parking lot, all the way around, sticking all the way around and coming back to the front of the building. So the parent drop off, runs along the front of the building here. This blue dot represents the main entrance 
to the school. That's where the students uh, will be coming in and out for parent drop, car pickup and car drop off on a daily basis. Again, like pointed out earlier, uh, bus traffic would mostly be coming from the north. We'll have a right in circling around, dropping off along this covered area. So the kids would be dropped off the bus under a cover and they have a cover to walk all the way in the back main entrance of the building. And we can talk a little bit more about how that works when we pull up the plan. We have um, three retention areas on the site, one inside of the bus loop, one just to the outside of the bedding here, and one within the parking. All three of these are dry, which that means is there won't be regularly standing water in those unless there's just been a rain event. As far as uh, riders or walkers, uh, there is a community here to the south. There will be a sidewalk extended along the front of the property. They can come across here, walk up here. There will be a bike rack provided out front for children that are riding their bike. They can lock their bike up here and then walk into the main entrance here. Or if they're coming from Spin Fisher, there will be a sidewalk or a crosswalk provided here where students can cross the street and then continue along that same path. So the main features of the site outside of uh, actually accessing it are the exist the main building, which consists of a three story, a two story and a single story portion. And you'll get a little better uh, feel for those once we look at some of the renderings and the uh, photos of the existing prototype that this is based off of. Some of the main points of that building are we've got three story and the two story. The three story base is where the admin area sits. The second and third story are a classroom space. This wing is all classroom. The back portion is classroom, uh, dining, music, and art. And we can go over those a little bit more in detail uh, once we look at the plans. There is a uh, tot lot that has a, uh, a shade structure that is over the top of it, along with a youth lot. That's where the younger kids will have uh, their uh, playtime at. To the uh, north of the side of the building, there is a covered eating area that students will be able to access. And then along, uh, once you, uh, you can leave there, walk along the sidewalk, and that will take you up to the gym, which uh, one thing nice about the K-8s uh, in regards to uh, instead of having an elementary school is the kids do get a, uh, a gymnasium. Elementary students only get a covered play area. So having the gym is a major plus, especially for the elementary students on hot days. They'll be able to actually be indoors in an air conditioned place having gym class instead of having to be outdoors. Behind the gym, we have our two uh, basketball courts. And then to the south of the gym, we have our track, play fields, and other uh, track amenities that go with that. Now, one of the things that came out of the previous community meeting that we went ahead and changed was there was a concern about the adjacency of the track and the lack of, of, of buffer between the existing community and the, uh, the track amenities. So the design team in OCPS, we worked this out. We actually slid the track slightly further away from the property line along with the play field and the other amenities. We're going to uh, keep the trees that are alive and existing and healthy in this uh, southwest corner, along with providing additional trees in that area to help with the buffer from the neighboring community so they don't have to worry about uh, sight and noise coming from that track. The last site amenity that I'll talk about, uh, OCPS requires all projects to show future portables, which would be located here. We do not anticipate those being needed when this school opens, but uh, as I said, uh, the, the district does require all sites to make uh, uh, feature uh, space for those just in case. But again, we do not anticipate needing those on this site when it opens. So we're going to talk a little bit about the floor plans of the building. So just to reorient yourself, the blue dot here is the main entrance to the building. We talked about on the previous site, the children will enter here. Admin and the media center is located to the right. The first and second grade classrooms are located to the left. As you walk along this spine, this long hallway of the building, the kids coming from the bus loop would enter back here off the bu bus loop covered walk and come in the building. Walking past here, you have dining, 
with the kitchen. And then we have music and art amenities. And then this back wing would be your uh, pre-K and kindergarten classrooms, along with uh, the gym having the first floor here. So the second floor of the building is all classroom space. And this is dedicated to our third through fifth graders. There's four stair towers for them to use. Typically, this back stair tower is dedicated for the middle school students. And you'll see that that goes all the way to the third floor. And that allows us to keep those students separated from the younger students so they don't intermingle. And as stated, the third floor is uh, middle school classrooms. And those include three science classrooms, which you'll see a picture of later. You can get an idea of uh, what those look like. So OCPS has a commitment to sustainability and being a good steward for the environment. So all of our projects are designed to the Green Globe standard. Some of the site features and building features here are listed. I won't read through them all, but I will point out that we have a low impact design to the stormwater system, uh, being good stewards to that system, and that the building is 10% more efficient than the ASHRAE 90.1. Most people won't know what that is, but that's basically what the building code requires us to design to to a minimum. So this building is 10% more energy efficient than that. And along with that, we have 95% of our instructional spaces have daylight. And that means all those classrooms that the kids are gonna be in are gonna have views to the outside, which is a really, really great advantage uh, to this uh, design. So now we get to look at, give you guys a look at what the building is going to look like. This is a view from the Northeast corner of the site so you'd be entering here as a parent to drop off, driving through here, circling through the parking lot around this dry retention area, coming back past the gymnasium to the front of the building. And as you can see, this whole uh, sidewalk along the front of the building is covered. So if it is raining, your children will be able to get out and get immediately under cover, whether you're at the front of the line or the back of the line and walk all the way to the main entrance of the building without having to worry about being rained on. This also acts as the entrance to the media center for after hours events. If the school decides to use the media center for after hours events, there is an entrance here that is also covered to have access to that space. You can see the gymnasium, which is a two story, story and a half, two story building in the background and the track amenities are off behind that. So this is a view from the southeast corner of the site. Again, if you're coming down Jason Dwelly from the north, there is a right-hand turn lane that you'll turn into the site, circle through the parking lot, come back to the front of the building again to our main entrance. You can see the bus loop here to the left that has the covered walk again, so the students getting out do not have to walk through the elements to get into the school. This portion of the building is that two story portion that I pointed out earlier, which has the first and second graders on the first floor. And then the second floor that runs the whole length of the building is third through fifth. This is the uh, prototype that the school is based off of. This is Pershing and this is located in South Orlando. As you can see, this is the main entrance. Just like we have in our school, it has a covered walk all the way along the front with your three story per, uh, portion, which has all the middle school students. This area over here is that two story portion that I just pointed out and your admin space is all down here. This is a view from the other corner. You can see the covered area for the entrance to the after hours for media center. You can actually see the covered eating area and the background here, which flanks the uh, cafeteria. And again, uh, the, the covered walk all the way along this walk. The uh, one difference that these project has is this has two lanes uh, as single traffic to allow people to pass, but we won't have that issue uh, over at the, on our site. So this is an image of the admin area. So this is where all visitors and students after the school opens will have to come in to enter the school. This acts as a sally port. So once you're inside of here, you are locked inside this space until a faculty member buzzes you either into the learning space or into the back of the admin area. This is a picture of the media center. Now it does say uh, middle school 
on the back wall here, but this is the uh, this is actually uh, a media center for the K through eighth graders. So there are areas for elementary and for the older kids. So you have different seated hiding. You have soft seating. We have a genius bar over here on the side here that the older students can sit, set up laptops, uh, do presentations and such like that. This would be a typical classroom. One thing you'll notice uh, is there's two different types of flooring. There's carpet and tile. This actually came from a recommendations from some of the staff. The schools used to be done all in carpet, but uh, now we do wet areas and areas leading into like the restroom in tile to allow for, you know, if there's spills, they can be easily cleaned up when we're not damaging carpet tiles. There's a sink here, bathroom. On the lower level, lower grades, there's cubbies for the kids' backpacks and coats and uh, materials. Again, the flooring are carpet squares, so it's hard to tell in the picture, but if one of these squares gets damaged or stained, you can actually just pull a little tiny section out and replace that section. You don't have to replace all the carpet. This is what we refer to, this blue wall is a learning wall that has the smart board on it where the teacher can do uh, digital instruction on. So this is the uh, science classroom that I spoke about earlier. And then this photo, it's actually set up for instructional use. So you see the tables are sort of clustered in seatings of four. So this is how the setting would be when the teacher was giving instruction. And what happens is when they go to do experiments, these tables are movable and they slide up against the casework. This casework that you see in the background actually runs around all three sides of the room. And there's a sink here these tables push up to that, and then that becomes their experiment area. So when they're in experiment mode, the tables are up against the casework. When they're in, in instructional mode, they're out in the center of the space. Again, we have a teaching wall that has a smart board on it. And then in this classroom, you can also see that there's an adjustable uh, science table for, for accessible users. So this is what we like to call a, a collaboratorium. What a collaboratorium is, is a space that allows uh, teachers from all these classrooms that are surrounding here that you really can't see to come out here for the, the students to interact and work on projects together. Uh, again, these are in every wing of all the classroom of all the classroom wings. I believe we have seven of them. They all have a smart board, whiteboard. They're all digitally. They have operable furniture so students and faculty can move these pieces around and uh, you know, organize them in a way that suits whatever's going on, whether it's small group learning, a little larger group learning, if it's multiple different projects going on from different classes. This just is allows students a space that they can actually collaborate and work on projects together that they might not normally be able to do when they're in their in individual classrooms. Here's a picture of our typical music room. This would be the uh, middle school music, uh, carpet floors, acoustical ceilings with uh, acoustical panels and special acoustical tiles to help with the sound. There's uh, storage provided for instruments. And again, these spaces also have a teaching wall with a smart board to allow for digital instruction. The K-8 has what we call a, a cafetorium. So that's a cafeteria that also acts as the auditorium. As you can see in this picture, there are some stage lights just up here to the left. So just to the left of this image, is the actual stage that is inside of the cafeteria. The typical cafeteria has their bench seating. The uh, board controls and sound control stage controls are housed in a little room back here in the back to allow for controls for anything that might be happening on the stage. The four doors you see down here on the end is your entrance to the kitchen and exit to the kitchens, along with we have storage and uh, bathrooms that flank the uh, cafeteria. At the end, you see we have large, large openings for uh, natural daylighting to come through. There's another nice feature of these uh, cafeterias is you get a lot of nice daylighting coming in here. Along with just outside of these windows is that covered eating area that I pointed out earlier. And this is the actual gym from the prototype that you guys, that this project is based off of. This is the Purging School gym. As you can see, it's a full size gym. It has a main court along with uh, two flanking 
practice courts, a main volleyball with two practice volleyball. The gym itself is 9,500 square feet and it has 638 capacity seating along this side on just one single side. Uh, the locker rooms and support space is off this side of the building. And then the main entrance would be just to the right of this image where you would come in from the front. This is an example of the shade structure over the top lot. So this is again from the prototype that this project is based on. Uh, you can see that the play area has a rubberized surface to uh, make it a little more forgiving when our little ones fall. And again, it has the shade structure provided to provide shade on those really hot you know, summer days. Now I'm going to take you guys a little bit through the uh, project schedule before I turn it over to the to the guys that are going to build this for you. Our uh, design documents were complete in September. We just recently received uh, our permit approval from the building department to actually build the project here this month. The construction is slated to start middle of January 2021, so next month. It will last to the end of May 2022. And the school will open in August 2022. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to David Romero, who's going to take you guys through the construction uh, portion of this job. All right, thank you, Ed. I uh, just want to first echo how excited we are to be a part of this project. Morton Smith is very excited to bring this beautiful school campus to this community. Um, so a little bit about what you can expect in the coming months. So like I mentioned before, construction is supposed to start in mid-January. Um, that means we'll be mobilizing to the site, getting some of our early prep work done, temp fencing around the site starting around January into February, um, and then kind of continuing from there. So what you can expect as far as the construction activities, the work hours will be Monday to Friday, uh, following Orange County restrictions, working from seven to six. Um, Certain activities may require us to work outside of those work hours, but proper notice will be given to all the people surrounding the community, the community surrounding the project, so everybody will know what's going on. Uh, construction deliveries will follow the same route. They'll come in Monday to or come in Monday to Friday. Again, working hours for us. All of our deliveries are going to come southbound on Jason Diwali. Um, that way we can avoid getting into the community area from the south side of the project. We're going to use this main entrance or our construction entrance on the north side of the property, it get all of that kind of traffic off of that main road as quickly as possible. Um, avoid any impact on the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, as far as what you can expect to see over the next couple of months, so like I said, we'll be mobilizing in January, getting started with our office trailer, setting and starting to grade the site, um, putting up temp fencing around the property. From there, we'll be starting um, some of the grading work, so digging up those retention ponds I mentioned earlier, starting to prep for some of our construction activities, um, and then starting to do some of our concrete work. So this is actually a tilt wall construction project, meaning the concrete walls for the entire perimeter of the building are cast or are formed and poured onto the ground, and then a crane will come in and tilt each one of those walls up. So we'll pour all of our concrete walls ahead of time. Um, it won't look like we're doing much. It'll just look like a lot of workers working out there for several weeks or up to a month. And then out of nowhere, a crane will come in um, and very quickly put all the walls together and it will look like a building standing uh, overnight, basically. It will happen over a couple of days. It'll be pretty quick activity. So we're, like I said before, we're very excited uh, to start this project and uh, can't wait to get going. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David and Ed. Uh, so now we're going to be opening the floor to questions. If you could advance the slide one more, we have uh, a little explainer here for how to access your Q&A panel. Um, while people are putting their questions in, we do have a few questions that have come in that we'll go ahead and start answering. Um, but this, this is how you go ahead and ask a question. So we have a question from a teacher. Um, Ed or George, I think this is going to be for you. Can you talk about how the smart boards are mounted at what height they're at? Are they um, mounted for adults or for children? I can answer that question. This is George from Siskovich. Um, we have varying heights uh, for pre-K and kindergarten. They're a little, little lower. I believe they're 30 inches to the bottom of the board. And as we go up uh, in the student uh, age, they go up to 36. So it's it's in between. So it's usable for both the teacher and the student. But uh, I believe there's two two different mounting heights for these uh, smart boards. 
OK, thank you. Um, we also had a, a question about how uh, we incorporate feedback um, from the frontline staff. And I want Cody to talk about that in just a second, but I did want to mention an important part of our process that I think you'd want to know about. Um, as, as you saw, this school is a prototype. It's been built before. And uh, an important part of our process here is that we uh, look for learning opportunities when we build a school. We do go out to you know all the staff that are using the school and ask them for their feedback. And that does lead to changes in the next use of the prototype. Um, so we're not, you know, changing um, the core features of a school based on input. We want to make sure all of our schools are equitable, but we do look for ideas to improve. Um, Cody, could you add to that? Is there anything you would want to add on, on that process? Yeah, specifically from uh, housekeeping, maintenance, food and nutrition services, which covers cafeteria, all of those uh, entities are what we call stakeholders, and they all get input through every phase of the design process. Uh, they get to ask questions, request items, and then those end up getting wrapped into each successive phase and have been essentially approved by their departments moving forward so that they're all captured. And then on top of that, uh, we learn from prototype to prototype and make improvements from lessons learned, which several things that Ed pointed out earlier, we, we've actually improved from Pershing. Great, that's really helpful. Um, there's a question about whether it's possible to include a shade structure on the youth playground. Um, so I just wanted to give a little bit of background here. Up until a few years ago, we didn't have shade structures on either the youth lot or the tot lot. And uh, the school board actually found $3 million they dedicated to doing all of the tot lots. Um, the reason that decision was made is because the uh, younger children are more likely to put their hands on, on a hot object and get burned than an older child. Um, and so they did go ahead and add them there. If uh, a school wants a shade structure on the youth lot, that is something that, you know, if the community wants to provide or if there's a sponsor in the community, um, that it's possible, but it, it does not come with the prototype. Um, and, you know, as as you're hearing, I mean, it was quite an expense to do just the one. And, um, you know, I think it was important to the school board that we did the same thing across all of the schools. Um, um, can I jump in yes, real quick? Please, please. Um, yeah, that actually um, was something that I have been discussing with the superintendent was um, uh, bringing forward a um, initiative to get the youth um, lots covered as well and that was something this year at our budget priority meeting um that i brought up but we decided that this year was not the year to do it in the budget obviously because we didn't know what was going to happen with covid and our funding from the state so um so this is definitely something that's on our radar that we're going to look at possibly um adding to future budget so stay tuned, basically. Yep, stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> Same channel. Okay. Um, so if you, Ed, could, if you might, don't mind bringing back up the um, the floor plans, I think that's like slide eleven or so. There's a question about whether each individual classroom has their own bathroom. Can you indicate um, how you would know if you know which classrooms have and which don't? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. So the uh, the requirements by SREF is, uh, and George can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's pre-K through second grade have their own individual bathrooms in each classroom. Is that correct, George? To, to third, to third to grade. Third. So to third grade, all of those classrooms will have their own bathroom. And then once they're above that, we have uh, group bathrooms that are uh, located on each floor for the older students to use. Fabulous. Um, there's a question. There are a couple of questions on here that are related to traffic. Um, and unfortunately, it doesn't look like um, our counterpart from Apopka has been able to join us, but we do have um, our civil engineer present and uh, our, we have a representative from facilities planning here. So, so see if we can answer these. Um, there's a question, will a traffic light be added on Kelly Park to assist with the traffic from Jason Dwelly? Um, Jay or Christopher, could either of you help with that one? 
Well, this is Jay. I definitely don't know if a uh, traffic signal was planned. That would have been something that would be answered by City of Apopka for sure. Christopher, unless you know something different. <laughs> That's my understanding as well. The, the city has that call. Okay. Yeah. And if someone, if someone from the city does end up hopping on, we'll see if we can come back to this one. Lauren, I had a, uh, I had an email from Pam that said she was trying to get on, but was not able to log on to this meeting. So I'm not sure what, what happened there. Oh, well, that's unfortunate. Okay. Um, there, there's another question. Uh, will Jason Dwelly be widened to accommodate the additional traffic? The picture showed four lanes, two lanes on each side. And Jay actually answered this one, but I think everyone would enjoy the answer. <laughs> I'll be happy to explain that. So basically what is happening is we are widening the pavement. The way that it's being widened is to expand the pavement into the existing medians. So the curb lines on both the east and the west side of the road are not changing. Just the uh, median is getting more narrow. And what will end up happening is we'll have a left turn lane into the school site as well as a right turn lane that goes into the school site. The, uh, the left turn lane for Spent and Fisher is getting shifted further over to the uh, east in order to accommodate the, uh, the right turn lane for the school. So the net result will be there'll be left turn lanes and, right, and a right turn lane going into the school, and there'll be one through lane each going northbound and southbound. Okay, I think that answers someone else that asked a similar question about road expansion and turn lanes, but I think you've covered that. Um, so there's a question that I think um, might be for our traffic consultant. So Sandra, maybe you can help us with this one, um, or maybe it's not you. The question is, uh, as a K-8 school, is there enough parking for teachers and families? Um, and so if, if there's someone who could explain how we come up with the, the numbers for the parking lot. Sandra, would that be you? Okay. Go, go ahead, whoever with starting. Oh, Sandra, we can't hear you. Oh, I don't know what's going on, Sandra. Um, you're not muted, but if you want to um, just type the question into the chat, I'll read it out loud, okay? And we'll, we'll just come back to it because Sandra was talking and we couldn't hear her. Um, so there's a question about the zoning. And the way the zoning works is it, it happens further down the process. There will be public meetings starting in the spring of 2021 to set the zone for this school. Um, it's not done at the same time as this process because in order to get a, a, a new school designed and built in time, it's a multi-year process. The zoning happens a little bit closer to when the school opens so that the latest information on where students live is, is incorporated. So if you live in an area that would be affected by the zoning, um, watch out for uh, an email announcement in the spring of 2021. Okay, let me look and see if we got any more. Looks like, oh, here's one. Will there be different start times for elementary and middle? Um, Raheem, do we know that yet? Um, Raheem, you're muted. There we go. Yeah, so I was looking on our, the K-8s that we have currently for our 2021 school times start at the same exact times as the elementary. So it's 845 to 3, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, and 845 to 2 on Wednesdays. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and, and Sandra, our traffic consultant, replied to the question about the parking lot, and she said the parking is based on OCPS requirements, which are greater than the parking standards required for a K-8 school from the Institute of Transportation Engineers Parking Generation Manual. Interesting. Okay, and so um, what schools typically do, we don't wanna overload a school site with, um, with parking so much so that we take all the fields. Um, cause as you can see, you can see how much space the uh, parking takes up. So rather than have, um, a school have a huge parking lot every day, what we like to try to do is, uh, when there's a special event, um, park people along the, the drop off and, and pick up lane. That can be a way to pick up some parking. Okay. I think there's another question in the chat. Lauren also speaking right. to that. We'll typically Please. park in the bus loop on those event days also. That's a good, great point. Thank you. 
Okay, um, I'm not seeing any other questions right now. Certainly feel free to uh, continue putting questions in if you have them. Um, Melissa, are there any remarks you'd like to make or things you'd like to draw attention to? Um, no, I well, I just want to once again thank um, uh, thanks, thank facilities in Zizkovich for working out our um, issues with the trees in the southwest corner. I know that was a concern for those homes there um, and making sure we had more buffering. And we really, um, we really came together and, um, you know, had a meeting and kind of problem solved that and decided moving the track a little bit would be able to save more of those trees. So I'm thrilled about that. Um, and then, you know, I, I'm loving, I love the design. I love that we're doing, that it's a very uh, green school. And that's something that I've actually been talking to um, the environmental department about, um, about the possibility of, you know, really expanding that with the school and maybe even um, looking at some uh, curriculum things, you know, um, uh, some environmental studies and things like that happening at the school. So uh, we're, I'm thrilled. I think that, um, I think the design is great. I'm excited. I think um, this is gonna be such a great, uh, such a great opportunity for our community. Okay, and we do have several questions that have come in in the last few minutes. Um, there was a, a question, um, let's see, are they going to stay with the option for the kids in fifth and eighth to stay with their current school even if they are rezoned? Okay, I think this question is about grandfather transfers. Melissa, um, I, I'm gonna try to explain it, but please back me up because you probably know more than I do about this. It typically, if your child is in the last grade of the grade of the grade level of a school, they would be able to grandfather, right? But since this is a K-8, does that apply to fifth too? I'm not sure about that. Okay. Maybe Raheem might know. I believe that's the gray area. So I would rather have uh, Carol McGowan sure. speak to that on that one, because I think it may be a difference, so. Okay, um, I will um, see if we can get an answer back to you. Um, if you could send me a, a private message, a private chat with your email address, I'm gonna pass it along to Carol McGowan, um, Narissa, who asked that question. So please send me your email address and I'm gonna connect you with Carol McGowan from um, student enrollment, she's the director of that department. Um, okay, a couple more questions. If all of the kids start at the same time, will the busing have K through eight on the same bus? Adam, can you help us with this one? Adam? Yes, oh, I'm going to unmute it. Yes, uh, if, if it's a K-8, then yes, all the students would ride on the same bus if they all were on the route in all those different grades. Okay. Um, now, George, I don't want to put you on the spot too much. I don't know if you uh, have this right in front of you, but they're asking how many classrooms of each grade is it planned for? And I believe there's some flexibility in that too. Um, but yeah, George, I have, George, yeah. I have the answers. Um, Great. I, my, my headphones just cut out. I don't know if you can hear me well. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we have one uh, pre pre K. We have eight kinder uh, kindergarten classes. Set uh, first through first, second, and third. We have seven classrooms of each. Those are the primary, and then fourth and fifth we have six of each, and then the middle school sixth, seventh, and eighth we have three of each of those. Then we have two skills lab. Once a computer skills lab. Once um, an elementary uh, science lab. And then eight resource rooms. We have six ESC classrooms and three ESC resource rooms. So in total, there's there's uh, upwards of 60 instructional spaces. So that's the breakdown. Okay, thank you. And I just wanted to add something. Um, Sandra Gorman, who's our traffic engineer, had a little more information on the signal. Um, she said the traffic volumes at that intersection don't currently meet the requirements for a traffic signal, even with the addition of the school. However, the city will likely monitor the intersection after the opening of the school. And we've definitely seen that happen before when it wasn't considered warranted based on the amount of traffic. And then when the school actually goes in, it does affect the numbers enough that they're then able to justify it. Um, we have a, a question about the, how the front office works. Um, I don't know. I saw that, Lauren. 
Yeah, I don't know if we can zoom in on it, but um, well, I can show it on the floor plan. I can answer it. I saw it in the chat. OK, uh, let me go to that, that view here. Yeah, maybe even the rendering or this so, could work too. Yeah. So there's actually two separate entrances at the front of the building. Uh, there's a set of double doors here that typically on the purging school, they use them now. They have them open when the students arrive in the morning and when they leave and they shut them the rest of the day. There's a separate entrance here, and then that goes into, and I'll, I'll bring up that picture of the admin space. That entrance is kind of behind where these yellow lines are on the floor, so the door is sort of here, and that's your main entrance into the building throughout the rest of the day. You do not enter into this hallway. The hallway that you see on the plan is actually off here to the left. You enter into a secure space where all uh, both doors into the building are locked, and you have to be allowed in by the staff after you've checked in and they make sure that you're supposed to be there. They'll buzz this door if you're supposed to go into the learning space. And there's another door off to the right if you're there to meet with staff members that they buzz open and you enter into the back of the house or the admin area that way. Okay, great. Thank you. Raheem, this next one I was hoping you could help me out with. Um, somebody wanted to know how magnets work. They were asking if this school would have a magnet, but could you just tell us about how a school gets or a magnet, how that works? Yeah, so what happens is that a school can apply for a magnet program through our um, school choice department. What initially happens is that the application is completed and then when for the first year, what it's called, I believe it's called an academy for the year and schools are there. And then the following year when it's officially announced that it's the magnet, that's when people can apply. So initially it won't be, um, there won't be any magnet programs, but there could be the potential, depending upon the principal, depending upon looking at other magnet programs in our district, if there's a need for something in the north area that other learning communities may not have that we may see as something unique that we want, um, that could be a potential possibility, but not for the 22-23 school year. Great, thank you. And and there's also a capacity issue, right? Like if the school's pretty full, we don't tend to do magnets, right? Correct, yeah. So it also depends upon the student enrollment, student enrollment at the time as well. Great, thank you. So yes, so no magnet school to open, but it's really the same process that any school would use, you know, any existing school. So if that school decides that they are interested in that. Um, and there's a question about capacity. It's around 1200, right? Do we have, does someone have an exact number? Yeah, it's uh, 1346. 1346. Do you happen to have how that's divided between elementary and middle? Um, I don't, but, you know, just keep in mind that uh, uh, primary, the, the student station count in primary is is lower. It's uh, 18 per classroom and then the intermediate classrooms are bigger. They're 22 students per classroom. Okay. The same, yes. applies, the same applies to middle school. So usually about two thirds elementary, one third middle is what they seem to usually be. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. If anyone, I'm going to see. Oh, wait. Another question came in. Hang on a second. Let me pull it up. Okay. There's a question about was it six? I, I um, George. How many fifth grade classes and how many sixth grade classes? Yeah. So yeah, I saw that question. So yeah, they're concerned that there's there's in in the middle school portion six, seventh, and eighth. We have three each uh, three classrooms of each. So in total, we have nine middle school classrooms. But and then the the fourth and fifth graders, there's six. So there's six fourth grade classes and six fifth grade classes. And then uh, when you go to middle school, there's three three of each. So um, that's that's what the facilities list, and that's how OCPS. I don't know if uh, somebody in programming can can answer that question. How the K eight versus the middle school works. Raheem, I can, yeah. yeah, I can add on to that. So part of that is going to be when the rezoning process comes in. Is that when the the six to eight part of the school? When you look at the rezoning, what typically happens is that you may have a large area for the K through five students that would attend that school. But then what happens is for the six to eight, the 
zoning shrinks to a much smaller area. So there's there's going to be a smaller number of middle school, so middle school students that are going to attend the school. So it's not going to be proportionate to the number of middle school students. It's going to be based upon the number of students that live in a smaller zoned area that will attend the school. So there is a possibility that you may be zoned for K through five to attend the school, but there is a possibility that you may not be zoned for six through eight. OK, that's really interesting. See, I learned something tonight, too. Um, there is a request that uh, I explain a little bit how we get to our our prototype sizes, um, and that's actually something that um, OCPS has come to over quite a number of years. There's been some studying about what um, ideal school sizes are, and we try not to go too far over them, um, and then we build a relief school. Um, and this this community is is a perfect example of that um, because you know Wolf Lake has ex an excess number of students, and we've sometimes been asked why wasn't Wolf Lake just built bigger? And the idea is that we don't want that oversize to be forever. Um, I know it's been a number of years, but but when a school is a little bit bigger than we initially planned it, we're waiting for those students to to be enough in the whole area to uh, support a new school. Because um, that is a question we get a lot of time that, you know, why don't you just build your elementary schools for 1200 and it's because, you know, that has doesn't prove to be the most ideal uh, situation for an elementary school size. So we try not to make that permanent, even though sometimes it it has to exist temporarily. OK, let me check and see if any other questions have come in. I think that covers them all. Just oh, wait, another question just came in. You guys are great. You've got such good questions. Okay, uh, there's one. Will middle school students change have periods and change classes through the day? Okay, um, Raheem, do you can you address that one? Yes. Yeah, so they all have different. Yes, they do switch for different periods, um, like a middle school schedule. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The only challenge is that usually what you find in a K eight school because of the fact that it's a smaller number of students. They may not have as many elective classes outside as a middle school traditionally has. Great, and kind of along the same line, um, there's a question about kind of what we're counting and not counting per grade level. So let me read this one. You said three classrooms per sixth, seventh, and eighth grades, but there are four content required areas: ELA, math, science, social studies. Are science labs not counted as, the, as those classrooms? So that's, Cody, that's, that's correct, Lauren. Okay. Yeah, so in addition true. to the three classrooms listed by the architect, there are also three middle school science labs. So that covers the four areas. Am I understanding that right? Okay. Yes. Okay, very good. And what I'd like to add is if you are watching this later or you know, you think of a question in five minutes, certainly feel free to reach out. I'm gonna put, um, oh wait, I think we got another one. But in, in a moment, I'm going to put uh, my email address into the chat. So if you have any questions that uh, that come up later, feel free to just email me. I'm going to say it verbally too. If you're watching this, it's Lauren Roth, L A U R E N dot R O T H at OCPS dot net. Um, and we did get a question about um, the principal appointment. Um, Raheem, can you explain the timing of that process, please? Sure. So what typically happens is that most of our principal principals for new schools are selected the year that the school is going to open. So in this case, if the school is going to open in August of 2022, we typically appoint the principal for the school in by the January school board meeting. That's really what the goal is, the January 2022 school board meeting. So what happens is that um, it will be an advertisement and it'll go out to all of the principals in Orange County Public Schools. It'll say site 90 K8 N7 um, principal vacancy. Typically what we look for is a sitting principal with a proven track record of success with looking at community relations, looking at um, academic success. And then also to, we really just try to find out who that, what the individual, what's the vision that he or she has for the school. And so that that interview happens with once the principal sitting principal it's sitting principals new principals do not have the opportunity because we believe that it's a rite of passage to open up a new school so it's something very exciting for an, a sitting principal to do 
And so when we have the um, principal that when they apply, they interview with they interview with me and my executive area director, Mindy Smith. And then what we do is then we take the names to Dr. Jenkins um, for the top candidates. And then Dr. Jenkins will make the final um, recommendation to the school board to appoint that person. That's always so fun. We just named three schools. It was last night, wasn't it, Melissa? So I know that that's that's a fun, uh, fun part. Um, let me ask my that panelists. Um, are there any questions that came straight to you that I didn't get? Or is there anything that came in that I missed? OK, I think silence is good. Um, I think that means I covered everything. So um, do feel free to reach out. Um, this presentation will be posted online. And if you know some of your neighbors or friends forgot and didn't make it on, I am going to be emailing out um, the recording to the entire group that registered because I know we had about 80 people register. So a few of them didn't make it and we'll make sure they get a copy of the recording. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you guys. Have a good night.